Good morning. I'm Ron. This is my wife, Erin. We are uh, pastors here. If you're a guest, I just want to take a moment to welcome you. Thanks for coming. Like Brandon said, we have these connection cards. Take a minute, just fill it out. No one's going to hassle you, but we just want to stay in touch. want to let you know what's going on, uh, how you can become a part of Coastal. Uh, we do say around here that if you give us one year of your life, that you will be changed for the better. And just really believe that. If you give us one year of your life, if you really plant yourself and become a part of the body of Christ here, we know that God will change your life. And um, after you fill that connection card out, just right through these doors right here to your left is an information table. Brandon will be there. We do have a very special gift for you. It's a beautiful mug and uh, something you can drink some coffee with in the morning. How many coffee drinkers we got here? Amen. Got to stay caffeinated. Amen. Guys, ushers, can you come down? We do want to receive our giving today. And, uh, hey, listen, you know, just encourage you. Be faithful in your giving. Uh, you know, God says there's, there's a promise attached to our faithfulness as tithers. It says that he'll open up the windows of heaven, right? You know, when I talk to people, and often I do, when people talk to me about their financial issues, uh, when people say, oh, you know, we're struggling here, we're having a hard time meeting this or or, you know, things, I always, the first thing I want to ask them is, are you tithing? Are you tithing? Because the Bible says if you're a tither, that you're really a part of God's kingdom economy, and there's no lack in heaven, right? And so many times we look at the financial struggles around us, and we say, man, I wish I had more money. But it might just be I need to steward the money I have a little better, and it starts with becoming a tither. Amen? And so just encourage you in that. So let's bless this. Father, thank you for this. As people give, just honor their faithfulness. Lord, let your word just be true over their life. Let Coastal Chapel, you know, Lord, we've often said, I believe you spoke it to me in a season before, that Coastal would be a wealthy church, that there would be no lack in Coastal Chapel. Just pray that over this house and also over its people. Lord, we know that, God, you want to bless your people. So, Lord, do that as they respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm wearing a suit today, and if you're here for the first time, trust me, I don't wear a suit every week, so don't get intimidated if you wore shorts. All right? But I told Essa, and I, I always reserve the right to spiff up, put a little shine on the old shoe, right? Got to do that from time to time. I want to talk to you today about dreams. I want to talk to you today about dreams. We're in a series on faith. And really, I want to just, again, I want to just convey a message to the dads. Dad, don't give up on your dream. Dad, don't give up on your dream. Dads, don't give up on your You know, your dream has value. Whenever God wants to do something in the earth, he starts with a dream. Think about that for a second. Whenever God wants to do something in the earth, he always starts with a dream. Whenever God wants to change a family, he'll give a man a dream. Whenever God wants to change a city, he'll give someone a dream. If he ever wanted to change a culture or a nation, he would give someone a dream. God always starts with a dream, and dreams are the seed of change. They are the seed of change. And we have to have, we have to assign a value to our dreams. And often, if we're not careful, we can abort our dreams in a valley. And we can, we can actually let go of the things that God has said, the promises of God, right? The purpose of God. We can just let those things go and think, oh, well, you know, in a difficult season, well, that's not going to ever happen. And really what we're doing is we're aborting a plan that God had from the foundations of the world. Our founding fathers had a dream when they came to this nation, a prosperous nation, with religious freedom. And they sacrificed so much. But look at our nation today. Alexander Graham Bell had a dream that one day we could communicate further than the human voice could be heard. And now look, we got cell phones that we can talk to people in other nations. Isn't that kind of cool? A dream. He didn't give up. LeBron James dreamed of being the best and winning championships. And now look, he lost this year. <laughs> and he's still not the best. You're right. All of us old heads in here still know that Jordan is the best. And there's wisdom with age, Marcus. Come on, somebody. Martin Luther King had one of the most famous dreams in history, a dream of racial equality. One day, little white children and black children will hold hands, 
right? And we see that dream has come to pass. At that time, that was an audacious dream. And really, that dream, in a sense, probably would never come true. But he did not give up on his dream. There was value in his dream. He didn't give up, and we see today the fruit of that. So, Dad, don't give up on your dream. Don't discount your dream. A couple of scriptures, and then I want to just give some, some thoughts today. Genesis 37, verse 3 says this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And that's Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Jacob or Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Because he had been born to him in his old age, he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. And when his brothers saw it, their father loved that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word to him. But Joseph had a dream. If you got your Bible open, you can underline that. Joseph had a dream. And when he had told his brothers, they hated him all the more. Psalm 105 says this. It says, until the time came to fulfill his dream, the Lord tested Joseph's character. So there was a time for his dream to be fulfilled. 13 years, Joseph labored for the dream that God had given him. 13 long years of hardship, imprisonment, a lot more down than up, more difficulty than triumph. But for 13 years, he labored for that dream. And like Psalm says, until that time came, his character was tested. But we know, looking back, now he didn't know it at the time, but we know, looking back, that dream came to pass. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for just encouraging the body of Christ here at Coastal. Lord, there's a spirit of faith that's rising in this house. There's a spirit of faith, Lord, that it's like the tide rising and every boat is being lifted. Every boat, every person, every family has been lifted. God, I just thank you for just imparting something into our spirit today about our dreams. Some of us need to dream again. Some of us need to put our shoulder to the stone and push and believe God. Some of us need to just trust and be still and know that you're God. But today, you're going to speak to us about our dreams in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that more space is given to the character of Joseph in the Bible than any other biblical character? Chapter after chapter after chapter, the Bible talks about his story in great detail. Joseph was one of 12 sons. He was a descendant of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob had 12 sons, which Joseph was the youngest, born to him at an old age. And because of that, Jacob loved him. He loved him. The father loved Jacob. And, and that's the first thing I want to talk to you about a dream is that you need to know that accompanied with every dream is favor. God puts his favor on you as his child, and that favor is a blanket that wraps your dreams. The, the scripture says that Israel or Jacob, the father, loved his son, and his favor was on him. In fact, he made him a coat a beautiful coat and put it on him. And that coat symbolized that favor or love that his father had for him. See, I'm just telling you that when I look out at you, Coastal Chapel, you may not see it with your natural eyes, but I know it spiritually that God has wrapped you in a coat of favor. Sometimes you don't even see that, but God has a coat of favor around you because you are a child of his and he loves you and that favor is wrapped around you. And sometimes it's difficult for you to see it, but the world can see it. I can see it. You know, uh, I think about um, many of you basketball fans. You guys remember Craig Sager. Anybody remember Craig Sager? Craig Sager was the minister of the crazy suit. I got some pictures of Craig Sager. Look at this guy right here. Can you believe... How crazy Craig Sager. I mean, you know, I think about a guy like this, and you know, there's, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm guilty of this, but you know, when you look at someone like, don't you kind of think, you know, really? <laughs> you know, really? Did you wear that today? You know what I'm saying? I mean, are you trying to be noticed by everybody? You know what I'm saying? Isn't there something in this that's like, dude, come on, seriously? I mean, you know, don't you wish he was just a little more monochromatic? And I just think that's how Joseph's brothers were, right? The coat that, that Jacob made Joseph was a loud, audacious coat. It was something that stood out to everyone. Everyone could see it. I mean, it was like just pop. 
popping with color. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't something that was difficult to see. It was plain to see. And you need to know that God's favor is plain to see. Is You are wrapped in God's favor. Psalm 50, uh, 5, 512 says, Surely the Lord will bless the righteous, and he surrounds them with favor as a shield. Somebody just needs to say amen right there. He, he encompasses you or he wraps you in his favor. You know, we've been talking last, last week and today we're talking a little, bit, a little bit about our story. You know, and again, it's our story. It's, it's not my story or the leader's story. It's our story as a family of God. But you, you remember that I was back here in this prayer room and we had met with five or four at the time painting contractors. And this fifth contractor was here on the property, and I was back in this prayer room just talking to him and showing him, oh, we don't need this, we do need this painted. And he was going around making all of his notes about all the things that need to be painted on the building. And he said, uh, and, and we were back in this prayer room talking, and I noticed that he had on his necklace, he had a gold necklace with a, a star of David and a crucifix. And I just thought, this brother has his bases covered. You know, he's a Catholic Jew. You know, all he needs now is... I don't know what, what else he needs to tell he's a Christian, but, but basically he needs the Holy Bible. You know what I'm saying? Word of faith, brother. But I said to him, I said, hey, man, are you a, are you a believer? He says, yeah. He says, yeah, I'm a believer. He says, man, we love God. I go to Israel every year. My wife and I, we're just devout Catholics. And I said, wow, that's great. I said, I got a story to tell you. And I began to tell him the story of, that, of the sidewalk, which many of you were here last week and you heard how God put my name in the sidewalk 60 years before we would become a part of this property. And, and I just began to tell him about how God did that and literally his face turned white as a ghost. He was freaked out about this, you know, and I could tell. And, uh, and, and we, we were actually, we had walked out and we were out there in the parking lot at the time and we started to walk back towards his truck and he said, uh, I said, well, I said, Anthony, tell me how much is it going to cost for us to get this building painted? He says, well, it's going to cost little of nothing. And I said, Anthony, listen, I'm in business and I understand you got to put food on your table. I'm not asking you for a discount. I'm just asking you for a fair price. And he says, listen, we're going to paint this building for free. Amen. And I said, bro. You don't have to do that. I'm not asking for a discount. You've got to, you've got to pay your employees. You've got to put, you know, take care of your family. Just give us a fair price. He says, Ron, I was praying last week, and I asked the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he says, I know this is it. Two days later, we got an email, $0 deposit, pressure wash, seal, prime, two coats of 14-year Sherwin-Williams painting, zero dollars doing completion. Every other co co quote was ten to fourteen thousand dollars. Guys, I want to tell you that's the favor of God. Come on, somebody, you listening to me. Amen. I'm just telling our story. I know everyone in here has probably heard that before, but I'm just reminding you that sometimes your life will intersect and you'll see the favor of God on your life. There's so many things that you don't see, but sometimes you'll see the absolute favor of God. And God has plans for you just like that. Your favor is not uh, performance-based, it's promise-based. It's a result of God's grace, not anything of your doing. So there's favor attached to every dream. So you need to know that it's not your hand that's going to make things come to pass in your life, but it's really God's favor. The second thing I see in this story is that there's always haters for every dream. There's always haters. This says two or three times that his brothers hated him. You know, there's always opposition to your dream. There's always, there's always an opposing voice to the dream that God has given you. There's always somebody with an opinion. There's always a committee out there that wants to say their two cents about everything. They want to tell you why you can't do it, why it's not going to happen, why you're believing too much or you're crazy or you've got, you know, you got a wild hair, just like we talked about last week with Abraham, people ridiculing him because of his belief that he would be a father in his old age. Guys, every dream is going to be faced with haters. And you just got to become comfortable with that. You just got to get comfortable that there's going to be people that don't believe in you and don't like you. Dad, people that don't think that you are a good person, people that don't think that you are doing all the right things, people that have their opinions. But listen, that's all they are. They're just opinions. 
Come on, I'm preaching just practically right into your spirit today. I'll never forget when I, when we started Coastal Chapel and I had, Aaron and I, we had decided together that I was going to go get my real estate license. And there was a, a friend of mine, uh, a brother from Georgia, a pastor friend of mine. I've known him since college, longtime friend. And I told him what I was going to do. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, get my real estate license so I can support my family while we plant this church because there wasn't any money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what am I going to do? And he says to me, he says, oh, Ron, what are people going to think? I don't know about that. He says, you know, how are people going to, are they going to think you're their pastor or their realtor? <laughs> and I just, you know, at the time, I mean, I was like, oh, man, wow. That is, I mean, what are people going to think, you know? What are people going to think? And guys, I kind of lived under that condemnation a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I kind of lived so fearfully about that. And I went ahead and got my real estate license. I want to tell you guys something. I want to tell you to the glory of God. Within the first three months of real estate, I had made more money than I'd ever made in any year of full-time ministry. Real estate has been such a blessing for my family. It's been a blessing for people in this congregation that I've helped purchase homes. The education I've gotten in real estate has helped me so much to, to, to further the wealth of our family, to, to put money aside for my kids' college, for me to be. It's, it's given me opportunities in the business world to connect with people that otherwise I would never meet. People who are so far from God that they would never set foot inside of a church so many people that I have met and connected with as business partners that I've had influence on their life that I prayed with them. People in my office, one lady that I met through real estate, this lady named Sally, they were, she was in her 60s and, and we, we got her under contract. Her and her husband, Robert, right over here, they live right out of Lantana. And literally three days after we went under contract, she had a massive stroke and went into the hospital. And when I talked to that brother, I said, Robert, listen, I want to get you out of this contract. You need to focus on your wife. You need to see her back to health. He says, oh, are you serious, Ron? Are you, would you do that for me? I said, yes, we'll do that for you. You're more important than any amount of money or this deal. Your family's more important than this house. You need to focus on your wife and get her back to health. We got him out of that contract. I went to see her on a Monday after that. I brought her flowers. I went into her on her bedside, and I said, Sally, I just small talk with her, and I said, Sally, um, I want to tell you something. I said, you know, I'm not really a real estate agent. Her eyes got this big. <laughs> she, she got, her eyes got big. And I said, I said, well, I said, you know, well, that is what I do. I said, but really who I am is I'm a pastor. And guys, I want to tell you, big gator tears started coming down her face. And I said, I want you to know that I've been praying for you, Sally. And I said, I've been praying that you would have the peace of God that you would know everything's going to be okay through this surgery, through all the things you're going to do. Everything, you'd have peace about it. You wouldn't be worried that Robert's going to be taking care of everything. She just started crying. And I said, Sally, but I've also been praying that you would have peace with God. I said, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? She says, no. In 60 years, I've never, I've never asked Jesus into my heart. And I said, I want to pray with you. I says, I can't do this prayer. You have to do it. Guys, I led her to the Lord at 63 years old. Listen to me. Yeah, come on, somebody. Two weeks later, Sally passed away. But I want to tell you, God is so sovereign that he intersected our lives at just the right time. Isn't that cool? You know what? If I'd have never got my real estate license, I would have never met Sally. I'd have been hanging out with all the saints. <laughs> right? You see, there's going to be haters, but no one can tell the story of your life but God himself. Only God knows the intricacies and the details of your life. All that's going to come from the dreams that he's put in your heart. When God gave me that dream of becoming a real estate broker, he knew what he was doing. He knew there was a purpose in that. He knew that he had a good plan laid out for my life. And guess what? Everybody who had their thoughts about why I shouldn't do it, why I couldn't do it, why it wasn't going to work out, how I was going to be a failure, how people were going to judge me, how the church was going to fall apart, guess what? They were wrong. Yeah. Amen. I'm just telling you, I'm not, I'm not glorifying my story. I'm just telling you that there's always going to be haters 
And I can only talk from my experience. There's always going to be opposition. But believe in the dream that God has given you, Dad. Whatever your dream is, stop asking everybody's permission. Because God might be calling you to something that you'll never get a consensus of opinions. Do what God has put in your heart. You know, the third thing in this story, so his brothers hated him and ended up, what happened is they plotted against him. We all know this story. They plotted against him and they, they were going to kill him, but his brother Reuben convinced them not to kill him, but they beat him and they threw him into a cistern. Now, a cistern in the Bible, anytime you read that, basically it was just a, a dry well that was dug to collect rainwater. In an air, air dry places, they would, you know, uh, carve out these cisterns so that they could collect rainwater. But the Bible says that this one was a dry place. You know, when I think about dreams, I think that we all know that dreams will take you to dry places. They'll take you to dry places because you have to contend for the dream that God has given you. You have to contend for it. There is an opposition. There's an opposing plan, but you have to contend for that dream. And sometimes you find yourself in a dry place. I remember with Coastal Chapel, we had that first year. You know, again, in this series, I'm just telling our story. So if you've heard these, just listen again. But when we first started Coastal Chapel in 2013, I was so excited about the dream that God had given I just thought that we were just going to go bananas, that this church was going to be a superstar church, you know, one of those headline stories in Charisma Magazine, you know what I mean? I just knew it. I was going to be traveling internationally and speaking and, you know, church planner extraordinaire, you know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. I just had all kind of things in my head, you know what I mean? We're going to talk about that at the end of this message too, but, but God had a plan. But basically that first year, and I always use the word, there was an expectation in my heart. And I think every dream starts with a great expectation. We all start out the gate with a lot of gusto. Come on now, I'm talking about dreams today. That second year, because I didn't see the results that I wanted, that second year I would characterize it with the word determination. And you guys remember me telling the story of how at the turn of that year, I said to myself, I'm going to make this church grow. I, I, it convicts me to even think that I said that, but I, I just, I white knuckled myself and I said, I'm going to lead better than I've ever led. I'm going to preach harder than I've ever preached. I'm going to study more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to have more coffees. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to just, I'm going to, this church is going to get on Ron's back. I'm a better leader than this. You know, I can do this. And man, God, it, it don't work like that. Y'all know that. But I was so determined but you know what? My determination took me further into a dry place because it seemed like instead of up and to the right, it went down and to the right. <laughs> Y'all feeling me, right? And you guys who've been here for a long time, you remember that's when God brought us into the summer of 2015 and the Lord began to speak to me and we called it a summer of rest. And guys, I was at the end of myself. Maybe you guys didn't know that. I know you've heard me tell the story, but I was at the end of myself. I didn't think that we were going to make it. They say in the first three years, church plants, most church plants fail. I just thought it was going to be over. And I just knew that, you know, it's like the business was doing great. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to bail out of this dream that God has given me. It's not happening. I must have missed God. I must have, you know, because, you know, in dry places, you start questioning yourself. Did I really hear God? Come on, somebody. You can't doubt what God said in the light while you're in the dark. Right? And God brought us in the summer 2015. It was a summer of rest. Remember, God began to speak to me about that scripture in Hebrews. which says, we labor to get into his rest. I began to get a revelation of the sovereignty of God. And how it wasn't contingent on me, but really, it's all about him. And if anything was going to happen for good, it wouldn't be because of my efforts. It'd just be because God willed it to happen and he orchestrated and did it. I mean, it was a revelation in my heart. But that was a dry place, a dry season in my life. And I had to just come to a place where it was only God that could bring 
the refreshing that I needed. See, in your dreams, you will come to the end of yourself. You'll find yourself in a dry place. Dad, you'll find yourself in a place where no one is affirming you. No one is giving you an attaboy. No one is saying you're doing a good job. You're carrying all the load. You're carrying the weight of the family. You're taking all the punches. You know, you're bringing that responsibility of coming back to make things right. You're, you're taking, you're, you're working, you're, you're, you're laboring with your business, you're laboring with your family, and you're at the end of yourself, and there's no one around you that's investing in you. But guess what? That's when you look to God. That's when you look to God. Dry places can become valleys of abortion. But listen, you got to let it be a spring of life from God himself. I think about the endurance that it took for this dream. 13 years of a dry place that Joseph found himself in, accused falsely. The Bible says that he was in prison and he helped the, the what was it, the, the cupbearer told him he was going to be restored. He says, hey, when you get back there, he says, just tell him about me. And the Bible says that that brother forgot him. It says that he forgot him. I mean, he was forgotten. He was in a dry place for 13 years, but that endurance. Dad, I want to tell you, keep enduring in your dream, that dream for your family, that dream for your business, that dream for your health, that dream for your freedom, whatever that dream is. Keep laboring, keep enduring in that dream. God is going to be faithful to you. You know, there's a key component in, in seeing the dream of God come to pass. And that component is growth. You know, Joseph had two sons before the, before the fulfillment of his dream. Guess what their names were? Manasseh and Ephraim. You guys ever heard those two names before? Manasseh and Ephraim. You know what Manasseh means? It means forgetting old things. Forgetting old things. And Ephraim means a fruitful season. You see, there's a part of your dream that's going to require you to forget some old things. That's why we preach so hard about the encounter around here. Because it's a place to lay things down. There's things that you've got to give to God. There's hurts and pains there's, there's things that only God can take from you, but you've got to forget those old things. You've got to forget those old things so that you can come into a fruitful season. Amen? Talking about the dream today. And then the last thing is just a, a point I think is so poignant is that sometimes our dreams require adjustments, just a little adjustment. You know, Joseph had an adjustment when he met his brothers. They had an adjustment really as well because he said, what you did to me, you thought it was for my demise, but God meant it for my good. So you have to adjust the way you see things. You have to adjust your perspective a little bit. You have to see that God is at work in your life. 28 seasons in Ecclesiastes 3, but there's never a season to quit because we know According to Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God always has a better. You see, Joseph filtered all of his disappointments through the lens of his dream. He embraced that process. He knew that God was in control. And because of that, God honored and gave him his heart's desire. The dream that he had of those, the sun and the stars bowing down the dream that he had of those bales of wheat bowing down, it came to pass. You see, don't give up on your dream because I promise you, if you'll continue growing, if you'll continue adjusting, if you'll continue through a dry place, if you'll continue enduring, God will orchestrate your dream to life. Can I get a good amen? Come on, that's good. You know, sometimes we don't know where our life will take us. And that's okay. That's okay. If you really believe in the sovereignty of God, now listen to me, Coastal. If I truly believe in God's sovereignty, then I know that where I am right now, okay, where I am right now, that God is in the midst of it. 
God is in the midst of it. And even if it looks bad, right? And even if in my own strength, I can't turn the tide, I can't change the circumstances, right? I know that God can work those things for his glory. And really, the worse it is, the greater opportunity that God has. It's that perspective thing. When we look at our lives, we have to see that somehow God is in control and God knows. And he may want to turn our devastation into a new dream. You know, our dear friends, I think we got some pictures. Our dear friends, Dan and Nicole. You guys, we talked about these guys. Remember we showed the video? Dan and Nicole Wilson. And this is Liv in the middle, Livia. And Livia is the only one of her kind. She has a missing chromosome. And everyone else in the world that has ever remotely had anything like what she has, has died. She, she is a fresh case for the doctors. They, they're, as they treat her, they are learning and discovering. She's an absolute miracle. Dan and Nicole's story, Dan and Nicole's story is one that brings such a compassion to my heart because they tried for years to have a child. They, had a, they found themselves pregnant and how, how far along was she, babe? She was nine months into her pregnancy, and they found out that they lost her. A little girl named Adelina Rain. And Dan and Nicole, Nicole gave birth to that stillborn baby. And um, that's devastating. And so basically that, that wrecked their whole life. Now, these, this couple have a heart for God. And for years, I'm talking, we've known these guys for years, 10, 15 years. Aaron's known them since, Aaron and Brandon have known them since they were teenagers. But their whole life, they've desired to be missionaries. In fact, twice, they have sold everything that they owned with the intention that they were going to go. They were, and they've always said, this, and I've heard them say this as they were teenagers because I was the young adult pastor of their church and they were part of the ministry there. I heard them say this so many times as teenagers and young adults. They would say, God, send us into the darkest places. Send us into the darkest places. And they, twice, they had sold everything to go to the jungles of Panama. I mean, like, listen, I'm not going to no jungle, y'all. Right? <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. If the AC goes off at my house, we're going to the Hilton. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to the jungles, so praise God for them. And, uh, and I think it was, I could, maybe it's both times Panama, but they just had this huge desire to go to the darkest places, you know? And, and they, their story, they would always say, our story is the greatest adventure. We want to have the greatest adventure. So they, Adelina, this devastating loss, and that just devastated their life. They ended up moving to Oklahoma. They left here, moved to Oklahoma. And um, Nicole found herself pregnant again with Livia. And uh, this picture is so cool because was it 18, two years? Like 18 months. This was the first time in 18 months that they ever rode in the front seat together. Since she was born, one of them always had to stay in the back to watch after her. So this is why they're smiling so big. It's kind of cool, right? But they just have such a difficult time with Livia. She requires so much. She has to be fed through, what do you call this? A feeding tube. I guess you don't feed through a trach, feeding tube. But they have to like monitor all night. She, she doesn't cry. So literally they have to stay up. One of them stays up all night, the other one sleeps. I mean, it's, you know, it's affected their work. You know, it's hard for him to work. Um, You can just imagine. Listen, guys, I got a couple kids that are healthy. And, man, sometimes we come to the end of ourselves. You know what I mean? So I can only imagine. And uh, we've, Coastal, you guys have given generously. In fact, over 
the Christmas holiday, we gave Dan and Nicole a thousand dollars. Our the congregation that we collected together. So you guys generously gave to help them with their stay in Dallas as she was having a surgery that would extend their time there. This guy's a great dad. Now, we just talked to them this week. Livy was in the hospital for a few days, and Aaron was talking to Nicole. And Nicole says, you know, I'm, I'm just here waiting for a ride. And she says, oh, is your truck still it broke down? And Aaron had known that weeks ago, how many weeks ago, five weeks ago, four weeks ago, some four or five weeks ago that their truck had broken down. And she says, yes, it's, it's still in the shop because they haven't had the money to get it repaired. It's $1,200 to get that truck repaired, okay? Money that they don't have. And Aaron and I, we were just so moved. We said, hey, we're going to give Coastal, we're going to give generously. We're going to give Coastal an opportunity. You know, we kind of feel like, you know, we're part of their story, you know? And we want to be a part of the body of Christ coming around someone like this that is in need. Amen? Are you listening to me? Come on now. Everybody, your butt didn't just get tightened up because I said we're going to give, right? <laughs> we're going to be generous. And if you don't want to give, you don't have to. But if you'd like to give, we're going to receive an offering for this couple today. And I'd love to call them this afternoon, FaceTime them and say, guess what? Your extended family at Coastal Chapel, we want to take care of that truck. We want to get it fixed so that you can take your daughter, uh, you know, to the hospital if you need it. You can get around if you need it, and you don't have to depend on anyone else. You know, bring some normalcy back to their life. Amen? Is that okay? Amen? Well, ushers, will you come forward? And then I'm just going to pray over this. You know, and listen, as you give, Aaron, come up here, babe, with me. You got that check? <laughs> she, already, she already put it in, so. But you know what? Listen, as, um, as you give this, you know, we talked about a dream today. You know, I believe in the law of sowing and reaping. I believe that sometimes our generosity unlocks things. That when God sees our heart, he responds. And so we're not doing this selfishly today, but we're going to pray over them. And also we're going to pray over our dreams. Okay? So let's just join our hearts together. Father, today.